Hello everyone, this is Bon Farmatic and we're not crazy, the system is. Tune in to the Radical Mental Health Show hosted by the Freedom Center Wednesday nights, 6 to 7 p.m. on Valley Free Radio, WXOJ 103.3 FM. Hi everybody, this is Will with the Mental Health Show on Valley Free Radio. And tonight we have um, a really interesting guest of Kate Bornstein, who is calling us from New York. Just a little bit about Kate, if people don't um, know. Uh, Kate is a very prominent um, writer and activist and speaker on transgender issues. And um, what's interesting about Kate's approach to trans- transgender rights and transgender communities is that um, Kate went surgically from having a socially identified sex of male to having a surgical transgender um, sex reassignment. But then in this process, Kate really rethought the whole opposition of male and female and now doesn't identify as either. Um, all of the above, none of the above. And this has really been, I would say, a tremendous inspiration to a lot of us who are rethinking um, the ways in which society puts us into boxes and especially around um, sexuality, the, uh, the idea that you have to be one thing or the other, that you have to necessarily fit into a gay, lesbian, bisexual label, identity, tag, the gender of male or female being something that you were stuck with. This has all been really overturned um, in Kate's work, and it's been really incredibly inspiring. She's the author of uh, a really great and enjoyable um, book to read about um, the life um, gender outlaw on men, women, and the rest of us. And um, that was a really successful book, and then went on to write a book called The, the Gender Workbook, which is really great. It's kind of like a really cool self-help book in the sense of going through asking questions, um, taking inventory, taking stock, and sort of exploring authentically who you are in stock without any kind of preconception or notion about what you should be, but what, uh, what's going to work for you in terms of what your sexuality is, what your desires are, what kind of life you want to live, what kind of identity you want to have, and the idea that identity is actually something that we can have some choice in. And I'm really excited about this um, new book that she has written, um, and it's called Hello, Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws. Um, so Kate has um, just come up with this, this amazing book of all these different things that we can look at in our lives that are better than doing ourselves in. And so I'm really excited to welcome Kate Forsting on the show today. Um, Kate, can you hear us? Hello. Hey, are you there? I am. Hey. I can barely hear you. Though. Okay, is that a little bit better? Not much, but <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to the show. It's really great. It's really great to have you. Thank you. You know, is there any way you could boost your volume? Uh, let's see. Well, we're we're running on a kind of screen here at the um, at the station, so I don't know. Is that helpful there? That's a little bit better. So as long as your audience knows, if I answer a question funny, it may be that I didn't hear it well. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't speak up to you. So, but yeah, welcome, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you joining us. And um, let's just get right in, into this. I mean, I know, um, you know suicide is a, is a huge issue, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what it is that, that brought you to... Um, Writing this, um, writing the book. Well, I've I've been writing mostly about um, postmodern gender theory uh, for the last uh, ten or twelve years. That's that's pretty much what I've done. Being a transsexual, I wanted to make some sense of it, and I found some sense of it in the nonsense of postmodernism. Um, and I've been pretty content to do that. That's that's been really swell. And then 9-11 hit, and I live in New York City, and it was doubly impactful for me then. Um, And frankly, at that point, I was going, of what value is postmodern gender theory in a world that's as mad as this one? 
it, it, what could I possibly offer the world from what I know that would help stem the tide of madness that seems to be engulfing the globe? And I couldn't figure that one out for years. I went into a deep, dark depression. I mean, one of those really deep, deep, dark, dark ones where even your therapist is, you know, calling you, going, you are you all right? Um, and finally, it just dawned on me, you know, you write what you know about. And what I know about is how to stay alive in this freaked up world uh, being the freak, the geek, and the queer that I am. I've, I've obviously developed some coping skills that have let me stay alive and be more or less a nice person while I'm doing it, even though uh, my identity may not fit in with what the normal identity uh, range for, for an American citizen is. So I wrote this one. I, I, I took a look at all the, all the different things I... I did to stay alive. Some of them were illegal. Some of them were immoral. I wrote them all down, and there's the book. Yeah, it's, it's amazing just the list of all the different things. Um, make longer range plans. Um, get out there and be a star. Make a dream come true for someone else. It's really, it's really pretty cool. And, and you mentioned um, the postmodern postmodern sexuality theory. Do you want to say just a little bit about what that means for you and how that might be helpful to people to, to think about that? Sure. The field, I mean, postmodern theory has been seriously and heavily taught in colleges for now uh, nearly two decades. And um, my own work has been being taught for about 12 years. Postmodernism simply means, well, Modernism was the concept that everything had an essential value. You look at a ceiling, it's a ceiling. You look at a floor, it's a floor. Real simple. Uh, Postmodernism says, yeah, that's a ceiling, but it's also the floor of the room upstairs. Uh, you look at the floor, and postmodernism says, yes, that's definitely a floor, but if you were downstairs, it would also be the ceiling. So postmodernism is the notion that things mean more than the one thing you'd like them to mean. And when it came to gender and sexuality, um, we took a long, hard look. A lot of postmodern theorists have taken a long, hard look on the notion that you have to be a man or a woman, and that's it. And frankly, there's no real proof for that, and there's an increasing... Uh, amount of proof that there are far more genders uh, than simply men or women. I could name two right now. Boys and girls right, are not right. the same genders as men and women. And this is really true in terms of looking at different cultures historically. That there have been more, more than just the male female gender in, uh, if you look at societies historically around the world. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in, on, North Amer on the North American continent alone, um, there were over 160 different documented genders before the Europeans arrived. Wow, 160. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so how, how does this come into the whole question of suicide and why, um, why we should live instead of, of dying? That's, that's what I think is interesting about your, your book is that you're not so much you know, analyzing suicide, you're saying, hey, look, here's some better things to do with yourself than kill yourself, which is really, it's a really good way to look at the, at the issue. And, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, things that are illegal or immoral, and I think that's really, I mean, it's, when it's as serious an issue as taking your own life, you have to get kind of real about the choices that people, that people have and the ways in which we need to kind of think out of the, out of the box. And we were, we were talking a little bit before you came on about just the idea that there's something almost I don't want to say positive, but if you can sort of use the suicidal impulse to make changes in who you are, do you want to say a little bit about that? <laughs> well, well, yeah, and this is what I learned from my gender change, frankly. Um, being a boy, being a man was making my life miserable. But that's who I was. Uh, you know, there was no getting away from it. That was a large part of who and what I was in the world. I was a boy, and I grew up into being a man. And when 
I finally shed both those identities and created a new identity for myself, uh, life became a whole lot more worth living. And this gave me a big clue to uh, suicidal thoughts or even having a very bad day. Um, what is it about my identity that needs to shift or, in fact, be totally done away with so that I can clear the decks for a new identity that I create that makes life worth living for me? And this is one of the central themes in the book. It's, I call it the art of selective serial suicide. You know, you just kill yourself over and over and over again. You don't kill your body. You don't kill who you are. You kill the part of yourself that needs to die so that you can go on living a really fun life. So it's like you have, it's not, you have business as usual, you get depressed, and then how do I get back to business as usual? How do I get on with being who I am? It's like you get depressed, you get suicidal, and then from there you rethink who you need to be, and maybe who you need to be needs, needs to change. Maybe there's a purpose to this kind of suicidal, depressed part of you. I don't think there's anything unnatural about suicidal tendencies. I mean, how many, I mean, my God, all you need to do is stand in a room full of people and say, all right, uh, those of you who want to, raise your hands who've uh, actually ever thought about killing yourself. And a, and a fair number of people will raise their hands. And that's far too many to, to, to be raised here in the country that's supposedly the, the, the home of the free and the land of the brave or whatever. Can you say something about, because I know, I mean, the rates of, of suicide and depression are higher among people who are outcasts and outsiders. Queer youth have higher rates of, of suicide and depression. Can you say something a little bit about the role that uh, oppression plays and homophobia plays in this sort of this whole mix of suicide and, and changing who we are or becoming who we are? Sure. According to the Center for Disease Control uh, in the United States, roughly 30% of teen suicides are committed by lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. 30%? 30%. Wow. Um, and yeah, you know, you go, wow, and that's, that's really something, but... The fact of the matter is there are 70% more people who are killing themselves. It's not just the LGBTQs. And, and what is it that most people who end up killing themselves have in common is something is screwed up with their identity, their desire, or their power. I can't be what I want to be. I can't love who I want to love or how I want to love them. Or I don't have the power I need to get things done that need doing. When, you, when, when your identity is in trouble, when your desire is being stifled, when your power is being pushed back, uh, those are all good ways to make someone's life not worth living. And frankly, um, when, you, when you get a government, the, the kind that we've got right now that sprang up in the name of national security after 9-1-1, it's very heavy into manipulating what's the correct identity to be in this world, what's the correct desire to have, and how much power should those people really have. And uh, I, I think Carl Rove and his buddies have really done a good job at making life worth a uh, lot less worth living. Um, but it's been going on for quite a while. Suicide rates uh, across the globe have tripled since the 1970s. Tripled. Hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that making the connection between, I mean, it's kind of a common sense thing. It's like the circumstances that someone lives in and the reason why they might not want to continue to live. I mean, that's a, a connection. It's a really pretty basic connection, but I think in an era of labeling people and saying, okay, you're bipolar, you're schizophrenic, or you've got this chemical imbalance, you kind of lost sight of the reasons why people, someone might be in a situation where, yeah, they, they do feel like their life isn't worth living. 
Um, so, I mean, you mentioned that this is something that you, you know, struggled with as well, especially, you know, post-911. What are some of the things that you do personally to kind of get you into, I want to live, even though we're in this crazy, messed up bush world? I don't ever really try to get into an I want to live phase. And, um, and, and I do need to make this clear. This book of mine is not a book of suicide prevention. There's no way I could prevent anyone from, anyone from killing themselves. Uh, and, and I don't try to give reasons why to stay alive, because I can barely come up with enough <laughs> um, What I have been able to come up with and what does work for me is not, oh, I should stay alive, but rather, well, I could kill myself, or, or more likely, I could continue having this really terrible day that I'm having, or I could do something else. And it's the whole notion that you could do something else that people tend to forget, or I tend to forget, when I'm in my darkest, most uh, deepest depression. When I'm in manic phase, when I'm just like out there, just like doing, 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 it's fine, everything's great and groovy, I love it. But as soon as I start feeling sad, or, boy, uh, like, why go on living? Can't answer that question. Can only decide to do something else other than what I'm doing that's making my life not worth living. Can you um, could you read a section of the of the book for us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, what I'd like to if you asked me to do this, this is not like impromptu. I, guess. <laughs> I know it, it sounded pretty smooth. I mean, it sounded pretty impromptu. <laughs> <laughs> The magic of radio. <laughs> but, but I did have a section that I would love to read, even though this is radio. There's a section in, in this book here that's called Hot Sex Tips and Dating Advice for Young Folk. Oh, right on. Bring it on. Okay. Mm. Hey, hey. Um, here we go. Sex does not have to mean marriage or children or even I love you. Sex can be right this minute, or next year sometime, you get to decide, and you get to change your mind about that whenever you want to. Sex can be a passionless quickie. Sex can be any way you imagine it to be. Sex does not have to be any way you do not want it to be. Sex doesn't have to be with one person over a long period of time, or even with one person at a time. Sex doesn't have to be with anyone but yourself. You get to control the guest list. Sex doesn't have to happen with anyone of any particular race, religion, gender, age, class, education, level, or body type. And sex does not have to be free. You can buy, sell, or trade sex for things if you need and want to do that. Sex doesn't mean you're a slut or a whore. Unless, of course, that's what you'd like to be. Sex does not have to be genital, and you do not have to do it in private. Sex doesn't have to end with an orgasm for everyone. During sex, you can be any gender you want to be, any age, race, class, animal, object, or alien life form that you'd like to be, as long as you both, or all of you, agree that's what you're safely and respectfully being together. Sex does not have to be in the missionary position. Sex does not have to happen on a bed, in a bedroom, in the dark. Sex can be really yummy, sick, gross, painful, scary, bloody, and degrading when you all or both agree to do it that way safely and respectfully together. Sex can be hilariously funny. Sex can be a lovely gift you give someone or someone gives you. Sex can be a blessing, a prayer, and a generous act of healing. Sex can involve costumes, props, and a script. Sex can be as soon as you finish listening to this radio broadcast, or while you're still listening to it. And there you have it. 
Wow, we, we need to get this into um, the required reading curriculum of high school. <laughs> that was really, that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think I, I, one of the things that I really like about that, I mean, there's two things that I like about that. One is the idea of just the, the, the freedom. And there's a, there's a quote that you, um, you quote, poet and activist Minnie Bruce Pratt saying, our imaginations are enthralled to the institutions of oppression. And really... I, I, just, I really couldn't agree with that more. Just opening up the imagination, and then also, you know, getting really—you're someone who's really been a, a real a warrior in a lot of ways against stigma, and really championing, you know, the outsider and the people who are considered deviants and the transgressors, and and just you know, in, embracing that part of yourself and, and not feeling obligated that that's who you are, but also feeling free to be who you are if that's who you are. So that, that, was really, that, was, that was really beautiful. Uh, you, are you um, really trying to speak to teens with this book? I mean, I know it's for everybody, but you mentioned in the, in the title it says um, for teens, well, teens, and other outlaws. The book started out, uh, the, the, the original title of the book was, you know, Hello, Cool World, 101 Alternatives to Teen Suicide. That's what it was. And I was just so angry at a world that was, I mean, it's hard enough to be a teenager with, with all the hormones going crazy and, and throwing, throwing your attention onto yourself all the time. It's hard enough, but, but then you add this garbage that's coming down from the government and all kinds of decrees and church and all kinds of decrees. It's really hard. So I wanted to write this mostly for teenagers. And, and I did, and that was the first draft of the book, and in fact, the second draft of the book. And then, when I turned in the second draft, my publisher at Seven Stories Press, Dan Simon, and my editor, Crystal Yakaki, took a look at it, and they started to send it around to, to, to all sorts, to, to people, you know, like 70s and 80s, and uh, and those people really liked it. And I went, huh. And um, Dan, my publisher, said, look, 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 I know you wanted to write this book for teens only, but sometimes when you write a book, it takes over its own writing. It takes on a life of its own. Please take one more look at it and see if you could change it and open it up so that more people could, could benefit from this wisdom. <laughs> wisdom. Um, so I did, and it occurred to me that it wasn't just teens. It was for freaks, and for anyone who's outside uh, the nonsensical laws of the culture. What kind of response have you gotten from, from people you are speaking towards and, and readers? Oh, well, you know, I, I, I go around and I do workshops based on this, and inevitably people say, you know, Kate, you know, I, before your workshop, before I read this book, you know, I, I wasn't considering suicide. No, no. no. <laughs> um, it's been really positive. People who've read the book um, have been thrilled with it, and, and this thrills me to no end. I am, however, getting a lot of flack from people who haven't read the book. Uh, flack from people who haven't read the book. That sounds that sounds great. <laughs> that's pretty pretty typical of some parts of our culture. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, remember now, I'm I'm recommending. You know, there are you. I think at, at the top of the show, you read off some very nice ones, nice alternatives to killing yourself, like. Keep on moving, uh, make a longer range plan. There's one in there, bake a cake, uh, you know, treat yourself like an honored guest. Uh, you know, about 95% of all the alternatives are, are really sweet. Uh, but that's not all that's kept me alive. And so there are, are alternatives in there that say, take drugs. No, really, take drugs. There's an alternative in there that says, starve yourself. There's an alternative about cutting. There's an alternative about diving into the depths of your madness. And these are not smart things to do. Not one of them is a smart thing to do. They're just barely 
better than killing yourself. But they are better than killing yourself. And I've used every one of them, and still do, to buy myself a little bit more time to crawl out of whatever mess I'm in and into a, a, an I want to live kind of a space. And so when people see, oh, you shouldn't be telling people to, to starve themselves, anorexia is a deadly disease. Yes. And in fact, starving yourself, and I say it in the book, it's the most deadly alternative, dangerous alternative in, in the whole book. But I've used it to stay alive. I cut myself sometimes to stay alive. I've learned how to cut um, without the self-loathing. That's one of the good things that I can tell people, and, and, I, and I hope your listeners hear this, that if you're doing these, these things to yourself that aren't healthy, uh, start trying to do them from a point of love. See where you can, what, what, what about yourself you can love. I'm not saying stop doing them. Yeah, it's keeping you alive, go ahead. But it's not smart uh, if you think that's the only thing that's going to keep you alive, because that's another principle of the book. Nothing, not one thing I have found, not not a god to worship, not not a philosophy to follow, not an action to do every morning when you wake up, nothing is going to keep you alive all the time. It changes because you change. And the only thing that makes all of these weird uh, alternatives to killing yourself work is the single directive in the book. Uh, for the geeks who are listening, call it the prime directive. But I call it the only rule in the book. And, there's, and the rule in the book is this. Don't be mean. Being mean is a sure road to making yourself want to die. I think that's how we're hardwired as human beings. If we're mean to other people, we start plotting our own death immediately. Uh, and if, if you look at, 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 at philosophers in the past, you know, Alistair Crowley was a wild man in, 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 in England, and he said, do whatever you want to do. That was his directive. Do whatever you want to do. And that didn't work because people were doing some pretty rotten things. So it does need to be modified. And I thought, well, do I, do I make the directive be kind or be nice or opt toward more freedom? And I realized that being kind, being nice, even the words freedom and liberty have been totally co-opted by the radical conservative right wing of this country. And so I, I, I couldn't think of spelling it out more clearly than don't be mean. Everybody knows what being mean is. We've all had people been mean to us. We all know when we're mean to someone. It feels terrible when we're mean to someone. So as long as you're not mean, you get to do whatever you want to do in order to make life worth living. You get to love who you want to love, how you want to love them. You get to get as much power to yourself as you can to get whatever you want done in the world, as long as you're not being mean. And in fact, I'm so sure of this, that in the book you get a get-out-of-hell-free card, so that in case I'm wrong, and you get sent to hell for doing something that wasn't mean to anyone, well, you give the devil that card, I will do your time in hell for you. <laughs> And don't, don't worry about it, because I'm a big masochist. I love pain. So everybody wins. It's a good deal. <laughs> that's amazing. The, um, yeah, the book is really there's a, a big dose of, of humor that's really so helpful with such a heavy topic as suicide. There's the, 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 all the different alternatives, the 101 different alternatives are organized into a chart and include the safety, how the more hearts, the safer and self-loving it is, the more skulls, the, le the less safe and self-loving, and there's how effective, um, how difficult the rating, and the ratings include anyone can do it. Um, you might need youth guidance. 
Uh, this guide is mandatory for anyone over 50, um, and then uh, no one older than Gener- Generation X should attempt to even read this option. So it's a really, it's a really amazing and fresh and completely different approach to, you know, what tends to be just such a heavy, heavy thing that people don't even want to want to talk about or even see it in a potentially creative and positive light. You were talking about this earlier. You were talking about um, people who have been diagnosed with quote-unquote mental illness. And I've, yeah, I've had three or four therapists who have wanted to diagnose me as bipolar, and I've just skated around that one. But the fact is, I'm learning how to live with it. I, 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 I've, I've learned how to live with it. It's a very different way to live than most people live in the world. But that shouldn't mean I should go kill myself. Does it mean it's going to be a bit of a harder harder life for me in a world that isn't equipped for people who travel to the extremes the way I do? Yeah. But it's a hard world for people who are left-handed because everything that people manufacture are for right-handed people. So, you know, yeah, you, you take what you have and you, and you make you make wonderful life out of it. So people are just joining us. We're talking with Kate Bornstein, who is the um, author of Gender Outlaw and the Gender Workbook, and has just come out with a new book called 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws. Look for it in your local independent uh, bookstore. Under the title, Hello, Cruel World. Hello, Cruel World. Yeah. Yeah. And and, um, I I think that the the theme in a lot of this is really uh, embracing exploration. And would you say that's what we're we're after here is people having an attitude of creative exploration and not judging or telling people what they should do, but really trying to create a space where doors are opening so people can find out for themselves how to manage their own wild extremes, for example, that someone might label bipolar. Yeah, and you might really screw up and hurt yourself. Okay, that's life. <laughs> uh, there aren't crash helmets for every given situation. You know, uh, God didn't birth you with a safety belt. Um so, yeah, I think, I think we're supposed to take risks in life. And I've tried in this book to lay out as many of the possible consequences of each of the uh, alternatives that I've chosen, as well as there's three essays in the book, one of them on identity, one of them on desire, and one of them on power. I talk a lot about bullies, because bullies can make life totally miserable for us. That's what George W. Bush is doing for the rest of the world. He's the archetypal bully, and America has become the world's bully. And I think we need to change that because that is not a healthy global situation, having a bully as the quote-unquote leader of the free world. Here, here. <laughs> can, you, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I think that, I mean, I know that I mean, all of us, I'm sure people who are listening, have someone in their life who maybe even in their present life, not necessarily their past, who is a bully and they are in a situation of, you know, emotional mistreatment or emotional abuse. What what is say to that person kind of person in that situation? I'd say you need to spot the bully first. And sometimes that's really hard because bullies come at you from a point of love. Look at George W. Bush. I honestly believe and it gags me to say this but I honestly believe the man feels he's doing the right thing and that he's acting from a place of love in uh, trying to keep freaks, geeks, and queers from going to his version of hell. Okay, but the techniques and the tactics he is employing to do that, uh, force over, uh, intimidation, um, and, and the very simple, here's how you can spot a bully. A bully will ask you either or questions. Uh, that's what bullies do. Either or questions are not questions at all. For example, the most famous one of his administration is right after 9-11, George Bush looked right into the camera and said, to the world, you're either with us 
or you're against us. And that's not a choice. That's only the opportunity to subscribe to his system of belief or be bad. And if you're being given that kind of a choice, no matter what it is, you've got a bully or someone who has caved in to bullies, uh, and you need to get away from it. You do not have any obligation to answer an either-or question, ever, because that's what robs you of your imagination. Yeah, I'm reminded of, of Ruth Gordon, um, who is who is an you know, actress who is in um, uh, Harold and Maude. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's a great quote from her. She says, um, uh, never, never, never face facts. <laughs> and I think that one of the either-or kind of the either or questions posed as a well you gotta face facts. It's either this or it's that. And uh, you know, facts and imagination don't necessarily <laughs> live in the same the same world and you know, we need the imagination. No, and this is this is coming up on in a whole on the whole literary circuit. Uh, people who are writing memoirs and and getting nailed because they're oh, yeah. telling the truth. And reality T V. That's so much no, oh, um, there is no reality TV, and there's no truth in any memoir that's out there. We all lie. I lie my butt off a lot, because why not? It's fun. I lie to get a point across. Uh, I'll tell a tall tale to simply be entertaining. However, if I'm telling a lie to be mean, or to get unfair advantage, which is also being mean, yeah, then I'm then I'm screwed over. But that poor sucker who <laughs> who bless her for all the good she does, but she whooped that guy uh, for 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 telling some lies in his book. He was making a point. I don't care about. It. I'm writing a memoir, and I'm I'm giving notice here and now. It's going to be filled with lies. Filled, filled with lies in the, in the creative sense of um, making your own identity in the sense of that when we tell stories about who we are, I mean, this comes back to what you're saying about postmodernism. It really all is, in some sense, lies, right? Uh, it's either lies or, God bless Stephen Colbert, he's my total hero, and I want to have his child. Uh, his word truthiness is is a lot more deep than I'm sure even he originally started with. Truthiness? Truthiness. He invented this word. It's the truth that's important to you. It's the truth that keeps you going. Um, for example, I, I had this whole uh, memory of, of, of my grandparents escaping from Russia, avoiding the czar, and fleeing through the forests from wolves to get to this country to freedom. And up until about two years ago, uh, that's what I believed. And then I found out none of it was true. Uh, my grandfather was a, uh, a what was called a white Russian. He was a supporter of the czar. Uh, he didn't even like my grandmother. Uh, they weren't in love. And, and which which notion of the truth, the truth I've lived with for, you know, almost all my 58 years, uh, do I do I carry with me? I like the picture of my grandparents completely in love. What the heck? Sue me. Yeah, instead of throwing you into an identity crisis, which I think is what a lot of people, or, or just defending something that's not... Um, you know, it's not necessarily going to be serving you. Yeah. And this uh, this whole idea of, well, you know, what's your gender? You know, this is, trannies get this one. Right. You know, are, are you a man or a woman? Which, of course, is an either or bully question, and gender itself is a bully system. But are you a man or a woman? Well, I've come, personally, I've come to a point where I don't think I'm either. I don't really fall into either category, but for a while I believed I was a woman, and uh, I was told, oh, you can't be, you're, you were born with the name Albert, and it said male on your birth certificate. 
just so? So what? Who says gender is unchangeable? Who says? Who gets to make these rules that keep people miserable? If there's going to be a real revolution in this country, it's probably going to start in the Pioneer Valley, <laughs> where people don't sit still for this kind of nonsense. The freaks are going to be the next revolution. This comes up to something that I'm very excited to get your thoughts about. It's just a vision for the future, because of, you know, the, you know, the mental health show, um, you know, the Icarus Project, that um, Kate is going to be emceeing an event with the Icarus Project on this Sunday in New York City. There's information about on the Icarus Project. Uh, website of the idea of somehow coming together in coalitions and flying our freak flag, whether it's a schizophrenia flag or a transgender flag or a, a do it yourself flag or whatever it is that, that really, what's sort of the vision for the future of what this might kind of lead to? Because I think you're onto something very big here. <laughs> I don't have a vision for the future. I'm, I'm too much of an old part to do that, to have that kind of a, of a vision. Uh, truly, I, I am encumbered by 58 years of, uh, 58 years. Um, here is my vision, though. The vision is that generation coming up after me, the people who are now anywhere from, you know, 14 to 40. Uh, are going to change the world. These folks, you folks, are embracing the notion of more than either or. You're embracing the notion of both and. And that to me says there's going to be an amazing good future. And since I believe in reincarnation, I get to be born in it. I'm so looking forward to that. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic. That's a vision I think definitely I, as always, this show's always end up being a lot shorter when and we, are, we are out of time. I, I just really want to thank you. And, and just do you have any, any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave folks with before we wind, wind down here? Yeah. Uh, if it ever gets to the point where life doesn't seem like it's worth living, if it's a horrible, horrible day, um, that's a signal that you are, you've become something, or you're doing something, or you've acquired something that's making life miserable for you. And if you get rid of that, not your life, then you've got a good chance of living a good life beyond it. And I, I believe in, in, in the basic goodness of people. So there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> And that's Kate Bornstein. The book is Hello, Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws. Um, look for it in your local independent bookstore. Um, it's amazing interview. It's really an honor to have um, Kate calling us from New York. And you can actually meet Kate and if you're going to be um, on the road or just in New York or might be catching us on the Internet. Um, tonight, uh, Kate is going to be emceeing uh, a big um, Get Your Freak On party event, workshops, um, festival, all kinds of different ways of healing ourselves, taking care of ourselves, that the Icarus Project is hosting at Judson Church in New York City um, this Sunday. So check out the Icarus Project website, the Icarus Project website, for more information about that. And um, thanks for joining the Mental Health Show. We will be um, back uh, next week, I believe that we're going to have Bruce Levine uh, next week. He is the author of Common Sense Rebellion, and he's going to be talking about the mental health system and the way in which the crazy society that we live in is driving a lot of the experiences that get diagnosed as mental illness. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> This is Pete Seeger. What country comes to mind when you hear this? The government illegally spies on civilians, produces phony news reports. People are imprisoned without charge or access to a lawyer. Prisoners are tortured and killed, and an illegal war launched on the basis of lies in which illegal weapons are used against civilians, 
against journalists and hospitals, unfortunately, the United States government is behind these actions. Fortunately, our Constitution has a remedy. It's called impeachment. <laughs> 